All right, well, in 2012, I was trying out for my second Olympic team. I had won an Olympic gold in 2008 in Beijing. <laughs> So naturally, I had my sights set on number two. Um, but unfortunately, I wouldn't make the team uh, in 2012. Now, I want to add, I made my first national team in 2003. And every year after that, up until 2012, I made every team. So to get to 2012 and not make the team, you can imagine I was devastated. I was ready to quit. I went home and started preparing my resume to apply to grad school <laughs> and just at a loss. So my mom was there at the trials, which was nothing special. She was at just about every major championship there was. But this time, she would end up meeting a gentleman by the name of Alan Friedman. He sat near to my mom in the stands at the trials and after seeing my performance in the finals, he went up to her and told her that he'd watched me over the years, he thought I had so much potential, uh, he's a retired sports psychologist and if I would allow it, he would love to work with me. So my mom took his phone number and a couple months went by and we finally had the conversation about what happened at the trials. And she said to me, when I see you out there, you don't look like you believe that you belong out there. Do you not believe you're good enough? I laughed and was like, of course I do. But she knew the truth and she told me about meeting Dr. Friedman and she felt that I would benefit from working with him. She gave me his phone number and said, do with it what you will. So, of course I knew my mom was right, as much as I didn't want to admit it. So I'd end up using the phone number. And on my first conversation with Dr. Friedman, he asked me, so what do you say to yourself when you're standing on the line? I told him how scared I was. I told him how painful that last 100 meters was gonna be, how it was just 50 seconds of pain. I just went on and on about how terrible it was. And the line went silent. And then finally, Dr. Friedman said, my gosh, Natasha, you've lost the race before it even begun. From there, we began to work on the way that I spoke to myself, recognized negative thoughts when they happened, changed them to positives, learned to develop optimism and change my relationship with failure. I'd call Dr. Friedman to improve my performance, but he would end up giving me an even bigger gift. I quickly began to realize that while these thoughts were manifesting on the track and negatively impacting my performance, it was showing up in my everyday life, my relationships with my friends, my families, the way that I viewed myself beyond the track, it was showing up in every part of my life. So Dr. Friedman and I, work together on changing my approach to each race. Anytime we'd run into trouble, he'd work with me on changing my outlook, opening myself to the possibilities ahead. And when I talk about this, I try to be careful because I know that it sounds like it's really small, small changes, and they are. But with practice, those were the things that made a really big impact on my life and would change the course of my career. My performances would drastically improve, and my career went places that I couldn't have imagined. I went from not making the team in 2012. In 2013, I became the US champ. I ended this. <laughs> I ended that season number four in the world. I'd go on to win <laughs> more world championship titles, and ultimately, a gold medal at the 2016 games in Rio. <laughs> Thank y'all. <laughs> now fast forward to 2020. Right after Christmas, 
things would abruptly end between myself and my son's father. It's also an Olympic year. So now I'm a single mother with a baby that's completely dependent on me, and I'm trying to make an Olympic team just 10 months after giving birth. Good old mama again. I don't know what you're gonna do, but you need to get into therapy again. <laughs> so this time now, I live in Austin, Texas. I have to do the search myself. I Google searched black female therapist in Austin, Texas. You're laughing, there were no results. It was scarce, right? But I ended up taking a chance on this lady named Raisley because this time I knew I needed something different. I knew I needed someone that looked like me, someone that could understand my journey as a black woman. And I vividly remember our first session. This time we were in person instead of on the phone. My son Liam is on my lap. I lay everything out and then I sit back and I look at her and I'm like, now fix it. <laughs> we still laugh about that to this day. But I'd continue seeing her every week. And finally, one week while sitting in session, I had a thought. Could being a therapist be something that I want to do? Now, every athlete knows that the end is coming, but how we actually prepare for it is another story. I knew the end was nearing, but did I have my plan ironed out? With the sudden changes, not so much. But something in that moment made me think, this is what I need to be doing. So clearly, I've been here before. I've dealt with mental health struggles, so I've dealt with providers. I thought about my black psychologist at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Friedman was an older white man. I worked with a spiritual advisor who was a white woman, and when I finally got to Raisley, she was one of very few. I began to think about the barriers that black people, and particularly black athletes, face when it comes to mental health, whether it be facing the stigmas in our communities, or the notion that we as athletes don't have the same problems. I used to always uh, tell this joke that sometimes uh, athletes are kind of viewed as superheroes, but actually behind those big, cool, scary things that we do, we're fighting some of the same imposter syndrome and performance anxiety that the next person does. So as I thought about all of those previous pract practitioners, and whether they know it or not, they left a lasting Im impact on my life. Um, and I knew that I needed to do something about it. <laughs> um, I also thought about Simone Biles when she announced that she wasn't gonna go forward in the Olympics. And I knew what it meant as a black woman to make that decision at that level. The Olympics only comes every four years. And to say, I'm not okay, I can't do this, I knew that had to be tough. So I wondered, who fills the space? Who fills the space to support us? And what would, have had, what would it have looked like if there were more black practitioners along the way? Would I have felt safer to ask for help? Would I have asked sooner? What would have made that difference for me? When I go out and talk to young girls, I preach about how we need more of us in the boardrooms and in the telling our stories from our lens and our experiences. We need women to influence the clauses in our contract when we need to have a baby. So as I sat on that couch, I realized that I needed to take my own advice because I remembered the time that I called my corporate sponsor at almost six months pregnant to tell them that I was pregnant. <laughs> and I remembered the feeling of relief when the woman on the other end of the line screamed, congratulations and we're gonna support you through this. So while sitting in that session, <laughs> I said, okay, we're gonna take our own advice. I didn't tell anyone. I went home, I researched clinical mental health programs. 
Then the world shut down with COVID. No one knew when the Olympics was gonna happen, so I enrolled in school. So I finished my master's at the University of South Carolina. I'm now a counselor in the athletic department. <laughs> Y'all are too kind. <laughs> I work with our student athletes and I've made it my mission to meet them where they are. I go out to practice, I hang out in the shadows and stay out of the way, but I want them to know that beyond the plays that they make, what I care about is the human beings making those plays. In my first session, I give the spiel, I'm a former student athlete, so I combine my lived experience with my clinical training to be of service. And then by the second or third session, someone comes back and says, how come you didn't tell me you're an Olympic gold medalist? <laughs> and it's because it's not about me anymore. Now I'm here to help you find your voice, to help you change the narrative in your story. I know how hard it is as a star athlete, as a mother, as a person of color, to simply say, I'm not okay. I need help. Society says there isn't space for us to be vulnerable and to ask for help or even a break. I understand the need for a space to feel safe and shed that superhero cape. A place where you don't have to perform and you can just be. I want my students and even you listening today to be aware of the way that you speak to yourself and the impact that it has on your journey. I lean a lot into that first session with Dr. Friedman. I think about the voices that echoed throughout my journey. Dr. Friedman helped me discover the most important voice, my voice. Now my starting lines look a lot different, motherhood, relationships, new career, deadlines, TED Talks. <laughs> All the just as scary as the 400, probably even scarier. But now I tell myself, you've done hard things before and you can do this again. So what do you say at your starting lines? What do you say before that next job interview? What do you say to yourself before that next big project? What do you say to yourself when you fall short? Are you telling yourself it's going to be OK? Are you telling yourself you're going to die the last 100 meters? <laughs> Are you telling yourself you're prepared for this? Are you telling yourself it's going to work out? I encourage you to speak positively to yourself, to know that you belong to celebrate at the starting line, to fill your phrases with joy and courage, and to let it propel you to your finish line. Thank you.